Uh, I will let uh, each of the panelists introduce themselves, and, uh, and then we'll get to the more topics and uh, topics of discussion. So please, uh, Chad, if you can start. Thank you, Val. And thanks, Val, for so much for uh, this forum. I think it's such a critical topic, and uh, it's an honor to be in the presence of this audience who are quite sophisticated. Uh, my background is I'm, I had a uh, background in U.S. government. I was in the CIA and also at DHS. My last assignment was as the chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security. And then since then, uh, I've gone on to form, along with Secretary Chertoff, uh, uh, it's basically a boutique advisory firm that both advises on security and invests in security called the Chertoff Group. Um, one of the key things, too, is since then I've remained active in cyber policy with the United States government. Today I'm a, what's called a government special employee on the Homeland Security Advisory Council to Secretary Nielsen at DHS, where we're looking at a number of the key threats uh, in cyber, uh, where I'm also participating in um, the uh, task force focused on countering foreign influence. And look forward to a great discussion today with these eminently qualified co-panelists. Oran? Um, Oran Hollander, head of cybersecurity for Telefonica in Germany. Um, I've been in the cybersecurity industry for over 15 years. Started uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces uh, in the cyber realm in the intelligence core. After that, moved to private consulting firms um, from small ones to bigger ones like EY. Uh, and about four years ago, I moved to Germany to take on the current role, um, dealing with all aspects of cyber and Telefonica. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Hans. Yes, hello. Hans Riemdun is my name. I'm the president of the German Cybersecurity Council. I started in the Ministry of Economy. I was uh, responsible for the Federal Network Agency, Bundesnetzagentur in Germany. Yes, responsible for energy and so on. And um, then um, I uh, uh, generated a startup together with Arne Schönbohm. He's a current president of the National Cybersecurity Authority, the BSI in Germany. And uh, after that, we founded the Cybersecurity Council together with the 16 states in Germany with their own law enforcement, with the DEX 30 concerns in Germany, and with the research environment, the industry, and the public sector. And uh, now we have 186 members, and uh, we generate a platform, and we want to reach the decision maker level. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, Rick Longenecker. Uh, so I have some time in the nuclear fuel industry. I used to be a nuclear fuel inspector. After that, I uh, worked with the United Nations for a number of years, setting up the global security program, ending up in Geneva. Now I'm the uh, head of security for Verishore Smart Alarms, which is the largest home security and small business security company, which is IoT-based for our services in Europe. Excellent. And uh, I'd like to uh, more point out that Rick and uh, Ansar alumni, they, they joined us uh, last year. So we'll definitely get back to like, you know, what, we, what we discussed last year and this year, how, how it has evolved, definitely tremendously evolved. So Chad, let's start with you. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, critical, uh, critical infrastructure security and, and the cyber aspect of it, uh, there is definitely a kind of a uh, disconnect and it's evolving. Uh, what are your thoughts and how do you, um, what are the poignant points that you want to raise uh, for critical infrastructure cybersecurity? Great, thank you, Val. I think for this audience and for a forum uh, like the multinational forum like this, the main thing that I wanted to try to put before the group uh, for, I think, a more intense discussion is a really tough topic, and that is the topic of deterrence. Um, Critical infrastructure in the United States, in my country, about 85% of that is owned by the private sector, not by the government. And so uh, when you step back and look at it, the paradigm is very difficult because uh, if we think back to the nuclear threat, um, it's almost the inverse of the nuclear threat, right? In the nuclear threat, if you were you know, a, a nuclear engineer in the 1950s, there was no better place to go than the United States government for if you're wanting to be at the cutting edge. So from a human talent point of view, the government dominated. From a resource point of view, the federal budget was growing and significant. Uh, they dominated the actual underlying uh, framework where we spent uh, in our country and with our allies you know, a multi-billion dollar infrastructure in order to detect anywhere on the globe. We could literally ascertain within seconds if there was the launch of a nuclear weapon anywhere on the planet, 
We knew exactly where the plume was. We knew the trajectory. And that enabled a doctrine of both attribution and retribution. And we had a publicly stated um, policy through our command and control response that was very hierarchical, going from the combatant commander for STRATCOM all the way, the controls of nuclear weapons, all the way up to the president. And that would be done in a very a quick way and with very little regard to the, you know, the consequences in terms of if we had to retaliate, uh, there was definitely going to be significant large-scale destruction. If you step and look at the cyber approach, the cyber paradigm, it's the actually the inverse in many respects, right? Which is today the U.S. government and our other governments around the world are not dominating the human talent. Uh, in many cases, they're not dominating the cyber technology. Uh, if you look at today, the cash on Apple's balance sheet alone, just to put this in context, is the equivalent of if you took all the, the market capitalization of Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, uh, and G, GD all combined. So just think about that, that literally the resources in the private sector, the talent in the private sector are outstripping our government's capabilities. And if you look at it in terms of the command and control scenario, um, it is unlike the nuclear threat, very hard to get attribution. Um, and in terms of retribution, we need to have a dynamic and decentralized response uh, in order to deal with this high wave, high volume, asymmetric threat versus the command and control, very hierarchical approach in the nuclear threat. So what, what I think is happening in the area of critical infrastructure that's so important is right now we know for a fact, and we've now, it's in our country, we've seen it, and in many of your countries you've seen it, critical infrastructure is not theoretically being probed and targeted. It's actually becoming one of the dominant forms of state actor uh, uh, activity. And so we saw that, for example, unfortunately in the Ukraine, uh, during the tensions with Russia, it's no accident that their utilities went down you know, for three days, affecting hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, we saw with Wanna WannaCry, a North Korean effort disguised as a commercial activity uh, with ransomware, which in fact was all about probing uh, attack vectors and critical infrastructure that brought down hospitals, brought down uh, multi multinational corporations like Maersk and FedEx, causing hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. And so at the end of the day, what we're seeing is that nation states are probing critical infrastructure. We do not have, as a, as a, as a, a global community, a stated doctrine of what will be governing nation state beha behavior in this space. And what is that leading to? It means that if there aren't costs to probing and, in some cases, disrupting critical infrastructure, there's no disincentive for states to do it. And, and Oran has a great phrase, I want to make sure to give him credit for it. He, he phrased it as, this will be the war between wars, meaning this will be the low-level conflict of probing critical infrastructure until the moment we have outright conflict between states. And so uh, the challenge I'd like to put before this group is one of the key topics is a what uh, Brad Smith called us to consider is a digital Geneva Convention. Some stated doctrine that we can get comfortable with as a group around which critical infrastructures are unacceptable for states to, to tamper with, and if they do so, what will be the costs in order to deter that? Absolutely. So, Oran, uh, your thoughts, you are, in a, you are in the middle of the, the, the transport and the telecommunication industry, and you've seen this for yourself from a, from a defense side as well. So, your thoughts around... Yeah. Um, yeah, I had interaction with the topic both in the telco industry and also in my time with the public sector back in Israel. Um, yeah, like Chad mentioned before, the war between wars, um, this silent war that is ongoing on a regular basis, um, is all about getting a foothold because when, let's say, when cyber war will be waging, um, it will not be from zero to 100, meaning you will have to be in a position of leverage in order to take advantage of what you have achieved. And as a result, this is a continuous war, right? So, um, 
And because of that, it needs to be looked at and uh, dealt with continuously as well. So it's not just about how do you prepare for the crisis, which is also very important, but also how do you assess where you are on a continuous basis. Um, I think one of the key issues that needs to be discussed is, and it's the same in the private sector, is the aspect of identification. And that is not only about how do you identify what, cons what are your critical assets, but also do, having the actual discussion about what is the definition of a critical asset or critical infrastructure, because this is continuously updated as time goes by. So one of the examples that I, I like using, uh, for example, is the notion of a connected car, which part of the world of IoT. Um, nowadays, when you look at it, sometimes maybe it feels like something that's quite remote, far away. But um, if you have somebody manipulating connected cars to a point where you have your uh, transportation infrastructure being damaged, if you consider a bridge to be critical infrastructure, would you not consider also the cars that can block it? Absolutely. So updating the definition, understanding what really are the critical assets um, is, I think, something that uh, can be highly improved and the conversation needs to start from there. Certainly, certainly. So, uh, Hans, expanding on those two topics, I think, uh, you know, the, in, in terms of the deterrence side and, 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 the, and the different aspects of critical infrastructure, uh, uh, where do you see this going from your point of view? Yes, um, you speak about deterrence. That is very interesting. But the problem is, and I can only speak for Germany and perhaps for Europe, we had a Last week, we had a big meeting with the energy suppliers in Athen, with the ENISA, the European Authority for Cybersecurity. And I think the problem is that we have no understanding. The people don't know that they have a big, large neighborhood, connected neighborhood. In Germany, we have 900 energy suppliers. We have 1,943 hospitals. And that is critical infrastructure. You can say, okay, what is critical infrastructure? But I say energy suppliers are critical infrastructure. And uh, we have in Germany an uh, IT security law. And every of the 900 energy suppliers have to implement an ISMS system, a ISO 27001, in the last three years. Normally, you need around about 16 months to implement such a process. It's not cybersecurity, it's a process. And what do you think, how many energy suppliers have implemented such a system in Germany, in the biggest economy in Europe? What do you think? Ten. Wow. No. 5.9%. And that is a problem. And uh, we have a national authority, the BSI, and last week we had a big cyber attack to the members of the German parliament, to some very popular actors, and they speak, oh, that is a GAU, yes, in Germany. That is an attack of our society. No, it's a normal daily business data leak. And now they want a new authority and so on. And um, we have a lot of reporting systems for the healthcare sector, for the energy sector, but it's, everything is pseudo. And um, I think we need a better understanding. We need an understanding on the decision-maker level. We have a lot of technical operators conferences, yes, and 99% of the CEOs in Germany, they say, wow, that is an important, sexy topic. But only 7% invest in cybersecurity. I'm a member in the board of directors of a big clinic concern. We make around about 600 million euros per year. And we invest 0.002% in cybersecurity. with around about 700 different systems in a normal German hospital. That is a big market for the industry. But where are the talents? Where are all the guys? Yeah, we have a big fight for talents, not only in Europe, also in the world. And uh, we need new education systems. I think that's a point for later. But now we start in Germany with a new initiative of 7 billion euros for the 40,000 schools, for the education system, for the IT infrastructure, but nobody speaks about pedagogical approaches and systems. And um, I think we have to start it. And um, in Germany, 
they speak in the last press conference from the BSI, and I know Arnie Schoenboom very good. I like him. It's a good friend of me. He said, oh, we have no problem in the energy sector. We had only attacks to our office systems. No scatter. Wow. And look at our German and French power plants. They don't have to attack the power plant. They go to the dozens of engineers' offices and they attack them in January. It is horrible for us and it's not a problem for a Chinese or a Russian attack to occupy our local energy suppliers. And then it's not a local problem of a village or a city, then it is minimum a European problem and we are in the beginning. And thank you for this conference because it's very important to reach the decision maker level. And, um, but we are in the beginning and um, we need new approaches. Thank you. Absolutely. So, so expanding on that topic, Hans, and, and, and going on to Rick, and you have had a fascinating career with, with uh, you know, both from the, from the critical, real critical infrastructure side, uh, you know, global critical, and then also United Nations, uh, and now in private sector. How do you see these three, uh, you know, coming together and, uh, you know, answering some of the issues that we just talked about? Well, I, I guess, I mean, I, I really focus now, um, I mean, I, I work in a private sector company in multiple countries, and I, I can say that the integration, cooperation, and the regulation of governments actually been really, really helpful. Uh, if you look at the, the stuff in California, uh, GDPR, love it or hate it, actually has pushed us in the right direction. Uh, there has been significant investment and, and thought about this, uh, although we have a ways to go. The National Cyber Security Center in the UK uh, and, and the uh, culture of digital media and sport, putting out the IoT guidelines has actually been a significant push. And if you kind of talk about the emphasis, um, I mean, coming, I still talk to people in nuclear, I, I, I talk how things are going, of course, from the UN perspective. Um, but basically, there, there still is a lot more emphasis that's needed in this area. Um, and, and quite frankly, you know, attribution, you know, a, a convention, we had a rousing discussion about it, is, is where do you actually place that? How do you actually start? Um, and so I'll let others discuss that. But I guess from a, you know, from a corporate perspective, when we had a regulation aspect that you know, we want to avoid a fine, we want to maintain our, our image, our brand, um, you know, so of course we're gonna work very extremely hard on this. And then from the other perspective, we actually look at security as a marketing tool over time. So, for instance, if we meet the UK cybersecurity essentials and we meet the UK, uh, you know, IoT minimum security requirements, we can actually put that as a brand, like anything else, on our product. And our product is sales. I mean, we, we do security, we sell peace of mind, but we have to get in your house first. So does Amazon, so does everybody else if you're selling security. And um, more or less that, that, that government regulation, that the government, you know, minimum standards that kind of pushes you in that general direction, will kind of be what propels industry to kind of continue to push in this area and, and build resilience. I, I guess the last point I would have is, is that basically one of the things that we don't talk about too much is that I kind of expect a large scale outage of the internet or some other main infrastructure in the next couple of years. We kind of have to expect this is gonna happen. And what are we gonna do about that? And of course, society is gonna be resilient. Things are gonna get less uh, convenient for a while. Um, but I, I don't know if that's actually discussed too much, that this is, this is a, a distinct possibility. I mean, our infrastructure is more sensitive than we actually, uh, you know, largely consider. Okay. So, so let's, uh, I think all moot points, uh, the, especially the resilience part. Um, so, so Chad, you talked about uh, deterrence and then expanding uh, on, on that topic. Uh, you know, hearing that there are three dimensions, you know, you, uh, there are new vectors coming up, but also new, um, new open areas such as connected vehicles. Um, we talked about the different regulations that are uh, they are there, but like 5.9 percent adoption of, uh, of compliance and impl implementation, and <laughs> probably so. Uh, and then the resilience. Um, how do we how do we get there? What's the what is the vision that you would like to paint for this and the audience and the global audience that we can take to the next level? Thanks. Well, I, I think the vision I would go back to is, again, this parallel that we talked about with the nuclear threat. So there's only one uh, state on this, the face of the earth that's ever used nuclear weapons against another country, and that's my, my country. The United States dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, there's only one state that, that reportedly, there's two states that reportedly first weaponized cyber. And I don't know because I was not in government, so 
please, I want to be clear that I don't know, and I'm not confirming or denying it, but David Sanger's reporting on op Operation Olympic Games uh, claims that both the Mossad and, and Unit 8200 in Israel, along with the United States, launched Stuxnet to take down the Iranian nuclear program. Um, if that's true, again, we're, the United States is one of the greatest innovators, whether it's in nuclear or in cyber. And if, if we don't start establishing norms, I'm not here to be hypocritical and say that, hey, it's only Russia, it's only China. I'm, what I'm trying to, to suggest is that if you look at those parallels, we ended up being the innovator and then realize, realizing that we had kind of unleashed, there's a genie in a bottle that's been un unleashed and we've got to now, even on our own selves, begin to develop norms. And what's happening right now is Iran, I think so eloquently put it, this war between wars, the silent war that's going on that's becoming not so silent, right? If you look at the, the World Economic Forum's uh, cyber research that was just released this year called Our Shared Digital Future, what you'll see in there is that um, they, they show that <clears throat> there were over 4.5 billion records that were compromised just in the first half of 2018 versus 2.7 billion for all of 2017. <clears throat> they also noted that it cost the global economy over $400 billion and that 74% of all businesses globally can expect to be hacked this year. And of those that are being hacked, a big, uh, an important critical piece of that can be handled by the private sector, but the one area that the nation states in a forum like the Cyber Future Dialogue can play an important role is in this area of establishing norms. So how do we, how do we look at that? How do we begin? What I'm suggesting is that this forum look at the, that first proposal by Microsoft and several other companies called the Digital uh, Cyber Convention. And you think of the paradigms on nuclear, the United States, even though we were the first to use it, recognized the dangers that if we didn't get some norms. And so we helped, along with other allies, develop the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. That also same paradigm was used in the development of other weapons of mass destruction. Think, think of chemical weapons, biological weapons, where we have developed uh, treaties and conventions. I'm not saying that they're going to be perfect, but one of the big criticisms that you're going to hear is, well, you're, you're never going to get everybody to sign up. It's going to, you know, how effective it will really be. To me, that's all excuses for not starting. And we can absolutely start if we pick maybe one, two, or three critical s sectors that we can all agree on. What I think uh, others have suggested is let's start with two kind of key areas. What are the critical infrastructures that threaten human life? There I can think of, it was, I think Hans mentioned power, so the youth power grid, the hospitals Hans mentioned, I think that's exactly right. Those, let's just start with those two. Or um, what would destabilize our, the global community economically? There you think of banks, financial. On any given day, on any given day, all banks are bankrupt if every, every depositor decides to go pull their deposits. The one thing that in our modern lifetimes could create a global financial meltdown is the, the day you and I open up our financial statements and they're not accurate and we then think, oh my God, I better get my hard cash out because I can no longer trust the digital records are accurate. That could create a global economic meltdown. So let's start small, let's start incremental, but let's start. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, great thoughts. Uh, Oran, uh, what do you think about, uh, you know, we talked about the, the need to start somewhere, right? And, uh, and Chad pointed out power grids and banks. Uh, in your sector specifically, it's the what connects those banks and everyone, right? So what do you, what do you think about refresh and restart on the critical infrastructure around, around telecom and, and networks? Um, so I would say that what we're finding generally all around is that we are, we're continuously relive, reliving history. So ever since the first virus coming out, then antivirus after that, network attack, firewall after that, and so on, uh, it's a continuous catch-up game. Um, so this asymmetry between attack and defense has been debated for a very long time. We see it everywhere. Um, it's, it's becoming even a bigger issue when you go into the world of IoT. Um, especially when you're creating devices that are much more mass in numbers, are um, 
much more basic in terms of capability. So if you want to do updates and change what you've put there before, um, so we're actually making things a bit more complicated because we're looking at security as an afterthought. The, the I would say the awareness for security and integrating it into the delivery process is much better than before. But um, in relation to the amount of new functionality that is being delivered, we're still behind. Um, one of the things that I'm actually mostly passionate about in the way where I think that nations can really deal with the threat is more about where can they leverage nation-level capabilities for defense purposes. Um, trying to sort of minimize the, the time span between when uh, an attacking capability is created until the proper defense is established as well. I think the major challenge is really about, at least for nations, is where, where do you balance the need for confidentiality and the capabilities that you create versus still wanting to protect against them potentially for uh, protecting your critical infrastructure against those same types of attacks being waged by other countries or not necessarily even countries, proxies or even just for criminal criminal activity or financial gain. Um, so there are a few things that I think that nations could take advantage of. So for example, considering the fact that um, the attacking capabilities are so much more advanced, one of the things that I would expect nations to be able to identify or uh, nation state levels is, is my critical infrastructure already compromised? Because like we said, this is an ongoing battle and most chances are that if there is an asset that has been identified by an attacking entity that will be needed in a future conflict, I would want to get a foothold there already. Meaning that, and also the, the paradigm has shifted to, I have been already compromised, so how do I minimize the impact? How do I bounce back much quicker? Uh, so for example, something called compromise assessment, which is where I go in and I my assumption is that I've been compromised, now I'm just looking for where it is. Um, utilizing nation state level capabilities to find those types of, of agents within your network, I think is something that is not really being utilized as much. Um, besides that, when people think cyber, it's usually this fancy digital aspect, everything is hyper-connected, uh, there are no borders, and that's true. Um, but there's a reason also why things like human factor and supply chain are also going up in importance. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm trying to get a role in the government, I'm gonna go through very strong scrutiny before I'm going to be accepted. And obviously, if I'm not uh, a citizen, most chances I'm not gonna be accepted in any way. Um, but on the other hand, if I wanna go and work for a critical infrastructure company, that have severe repercussions on a, on a company's economy, uh, sorry, on a country's economy, the vetting is not even close to being the same. Um, and I think that they're utilizing countries' capability to do proper vetting, both for personnel alongside vendors and partners that you work with, especially considering, you know, the, the chase after cost reduction and globalization, and you find yourself getting services from countries you never even knew. Um, I think having countries involved in that is also something that is very important on top of, of course, orchestrating the regular things that are being done at the moment, regulation, threat intelligence sharing, which is in its infancy and so on. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to the threat intelligence sharing part. Of course, there's a topic on that, but excellent points. Hans, what do you see in terms of the, the government involvement and, uh, uh, you know, uh, or also picked up the topic of, of how do you trust like the, the supply chain basically of, of your um, of your network and environment right and also uh, you know how do you see this coming together are nations uh, ready to uh, do this compromise assessments on themselves um, I think um, today I, th I heard that they will present in space of the World Economic Forum the new white paper from the energy group yes with Boston consult and uh, with uh, the former chief of Swisscom, um, that's a good first step. But I think we have to start before. In Germany and in Europe, we have the big problem, together with the government, that we don't understand and don't control our own systems. And if you see, yesterday we had a big picture with the chief of the cybersecurity center from the German Telekom in Bonn. Anne Schönbaum 
says that is the new Beersheba of Germany. And um, who is the main supplier of the German telecom? For the law enforcement, for the government, for our scatter systems. And by the way, a lot of our scatter systems are 25 years old. Mm -hmm. That is Huawei. And now we can stop the discussion about cybersecurity, about cyber spionage, about the backbone of the German industry, the SMEs. And um, I think that we should change together with our friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have to support more disruptive innovations. Now we start in Germany with a new addict agency with 100 million euros, that is nothing. Go to the United States, you can, it is 110 billion euros. We have in Germany no private equity environment. That is a big problem. If you go to a German bank and say, hey, I have a good disruptive innovation in cybersecurity, they say, oh, where's the business plan? Please come later in eight months. That's not enough. And that is a big problem. And you see it. We have the data leak scandal last week in Germany with a hyper TV program and so on. But um, they don't... Um, understand it and they don't invest in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, need a, we need a structure, we need platforms. But look at the energy sector. We have, for example, no platform for the energy sector in the, United, in the uh, European Union. And now we start with our council with our own energy hub, but that is in the beginning, yes? The big energy, the Vattenfall, the E.ON, they, they have no platform together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is a, a big problem, and we have to start to generate own systems. Yes, it cannot be that we get China software and hardware, and that we get cybersecurity from Russia. Yes, and I think we need a we need a standardization. We need security by design. If you want to buy an aircraft, you want a safe landing, happy landing. Yes. And um, I think Important. that's the same in the IT industry. And um, I think um, that, is, that is a big problem. And uh, we, have, we need an open box. We need a platform, an international platform, where we say, okay, if you produce software or hardware, we will check it. Okay. And that is not easy. Yes, don't misunderstand me. Yes, if you get an update, then it's an it's old product. Yeah, but I think we need international standardization together with Russia, with China, with India, with the European Union and with the United States. And um, then it is authentic. Okay, thanks. Rick, um, your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier. I think the UK is on the right track. Um, I had a funny thought when I was sitting here. Um, what about tax breaks for cybersecurity investment for businesses? That's coming that sounds like a great thing to lobby for, yeah. um, because that's kind of the bottom line driver. Um, but yeah, more regulation. We were discussing CE certification, UL certification in America, um, and uh, basically the, the possibility for you know, also regulation as far as cyber is concerned. I mean, this is, this is all going to drive it. Um, and yeah, just increased, increased guidance, increased regulation, but in the right perspective, yeah, right. and tax breaks. Yeah. Okay. We got uh, two minutes, so maybe 30 seconds of closing thoughts, uh, right, across, and then maybe uh, Rick, you just complete, and then uh, we'll go backwards. I, I've said enough. I'm good. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, Hans, how about uh, some closing thoughts? Yes. I think it's very important um, to organize more events like here today, like with Synet, with the German Cybersecurity Council, with our friends in, in the world, with everybody and um, I think it's it's our responsibility and um, if you know normally in Germany we need 218 days to understand that we have an incident and uh, that is primary the reason is that in 80% of all the cases the problem is awareness and please let's start to to uh, organize, a, I say, a hacker soup, yes, in the cafeteria, yes, of your company, then it's a big advantage. And then we can speak later about uh, China and uh, to control our own system. So the, but at first, we need awareness for the employees and for the management. Absolutely. And not only for the CIO or the 
IT security officer. It's, it's wholesome a question of awareness. Yeah? Wholesome awareness. Yes. That's the most point. Great. Thank, Thank you, Hans. You. Or any your closing thoughts? Yeah. Um, I would say that the fight that we had as security people in the beginning is to try to convince decision makers that security is not just a tech technical issue, technological issue, but it's a business issue. And now I think the fight is also to make it clear that it's not just a business issue, but also a safety issue. And I think that these types of forums and discussions, considering the convergence of digital world, physical world, and our continuous dependence to a point of almost over-dependence on technology, is putting us in a situation where if we don't have these discussions early enough, then uh, it might be a little too late to deal with. So great initiative and good time to talk about it. Excellent. And then, Chad, we're getting the hook, so but, uh, your, your thoughts as well to close this panel. Um, just a quick provocative thought in closing. So going back to deterrence, the two core elements... Oh, sorry. The two core elements that you need for deterrence to work is a credible attribution capability with a stated doctrine of retaliation. So attribution, retaliation. And right now, if you look at it, the good news is that we're starting to see attribution. We attributed WannaCry, for example, to the North Koreans publicly. Uh, the problem is, can anyone in this room tell me what was the consequence to North Korea for doing that? And by the way, it was not just an attack on critical infrastructure, but it was an egregious, indiscriminate attack that not only affected hospitals in the UK, auto plants in German, uh, Japan, um, it even in the United States, shipping companies, uh, but if you look at even their own ally, China, had universities that went down because of WannaCry. So if we're going to have attribution to an actor who's actually engaged in this type of targeting of critical infrastructure in a completely indiscriminate way, at least Stuxnet, whoever did it, was trying to be surgical in that attack. This type of indiscriminate attack, you need to be able to have retribution. And some of the government have told me, well, we, we did it, we had a retribution against North Korea. My point is, unless you put a head on a spear that is public, then the deterrence doesn't work. So we have an opportunity with North Korea, who the whole world can agree should never have done that, even their own ally, China, who was a victim of the attack, and we need to, it's not too late to publicly take retribution so that we prevent future attacks like that. Use this as a teachable moment. It's not too late. And that can begin what you know, Rick used to work at the IAEA on the nuclear side. I think we need a, an a, a equivalent, a multilateral, multinational entity like IAEA that can do cyber attribution the way IAEA does nuclear on their side. Excellent. Very, very strong note. We close that with a very, very strong note. So great points taken. And that sets the stage for the, for the next uh, five panels to expand this. But thank you very much. I'd like to thank Chad, Oren, uh, Hans, and Rick. Very nice. Thank you.